Good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing? I want to tell you one thing. Jesus is alive. You're alive with him. He's seated on the throne, and we're seated there with him. Hallelujah. Amen. Welcome to Bible Basics. Welcome to Victory's Vision. We have these glasses for everybody. You got your glasses on? Get them on there. See yourself in Christ. You got your glasses on there, buddy? Amen. You see the cross and see the blood. Not yourself with all your mistakes and faults. They're on the cross. They're on the blood. Amen. You know, a lot of people go, if Jesus would just appear himself in front of me, I would believe him then, which is a bunch of bunk. They won't. Because Psalm 19 says, all the heavens declare the glory of God. Everything on the earth shows the glory of God. And still, they don't believe. Many people don't believe. God has given us evidence for so many things, for himself all over the place, everywhere. You only have to look. You only have to have your eyes open. Today, we're going to continue what we talked about last week. Last week, we talked about the flood of Noah, Genesis flood, and we talked about the Ark of the Covenant, how, or Ark of the Covenant, the Ark, how big it was, huge, huge. Anybody remember how many semis were 300 over some, 335 semis, something like that. That's a pretty big arc. We want to talk about the flood today. Is there evidence in the earth of the flood going on? The destruction of the Genesis flood, is there evidence? Yes, much evidence. Many things are evidence. I have three movies I want to show us, show today. The importance of understanding God's evidence. Genesis 7, 15 through 19, they went into the ark with Noah, his whole family. Two and two of all flesh in which there was the breath of life, and those that entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as God commanded them, and the Lord shut them in. He shut the door of the ark. The flood continued 40 days on the earth. The waters increased and bore up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. The waters prevailed and increased greatly on the earth, and the ark floated on the face of the waters. Genesis 7, 15 through 19. When people hear about the story of the flood, at least for me, when I heard the story of the flood, I thought, well, I'm not sure if it's true or not true. I joined a certain denomination uh, that Nancy was in before we got married, and I asked the minister, I says, what do you think? You think this Adam and Eve stuff and this flood stuff is a fairy tale? And he said, yeah, I think it is. So I kind of, well, I didn't want one sure until I got saved. And then the Lord opens up Scripture to you, and he shows you all kind of evidence in Scripture that matches with evidence in the, in the world, on the earth. There's evidence all over the place. And people think, well, the Noah's flood, well, it just rained so many days, and there was rain here and there, and there might have been a puddle here and there and a puddle here and there. There is way, way much more to it. And God has given us evidence on that, and I'm going to show you today what's the evidence. The fountains of the great deep were broken up and burst forth. What would be the fountains of the great deep? What's a fountain? thing of water? It says that came, water came up from the ground. In the Garden of Eden, it was mist that was coming up from the ground. But what really happened, it says in the year 600 of Noah's life, Noah took 100 years to build the ark. So here he's 600 years. In the 17th day of the second month, that same day, all the fountains of the great deep were broken up and burst forth, and the windows and floodgates of the heavens were opened, and it rained upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. This is from Hawaii. Mount Kilimanjaro, and I think it's in 2018. This, as it, the volcano was happening, even under the water, this volcanic action was taking place, even under the water. So when it says the fountains of the earth, the fountains of the earth were broken up and burst forth, this is what happened all over the place, all over the earth, not just under waters but all over, everywhere. I'm going to show you a couple of movies on Mount St. Helens. That's one, one volcano. Can you imagine of the whole earth, volcanoes going off 
all over the place. And I want you to pay attention to what they say about these volcanoes, the power of these volcanoes, of one volcano. And imagine that by thousands, or who knows how many went off. You know, only God knows. Noah's not around. He can't tell us. He wouldn't know all of them anyways. Rain, volcanoes, windstorms, tectonic plates of the earth splitting into continents. What would cause tectonic plates in the continents to split? Extreme pressure from all these volcanoes going off. Extreme pressure. Pretty heavy. Yeah. Is there evidence of this flood in the earth? That's what we want to look at. Proof. I'm here in beautiful Washington State at one of the most important geological sites of the 20th century, Mount St. Helens. Now this volcano erupted on May 18th, 1980, about 40 years ago. Tragically, 57 people died and one billion dollars worth of property was destroyed in this eruption. Amazingly, over 230 square miles of forest were immediately flattened by the eruption's blast. But standing here a mere 40 years or so later, you'd never know it. This area has recovered and is once again a beautiful wilderness. Now, while the eruption was tragic, it gave geologists a massive amount of first-hand data on the catastrophic effect an event like this can have on geology. Watching one relatively small volcano, compared to volcanoes in the past, erupt, and the incredible changes that it brought to this landscape, well, it really challenges the evolutionary belief that these slow, gradual processes have shaped our planet. Did you know that Mount St. Helens has a mini Grand Canyon? It's said to be about 1 40th the scale of the more impressive Grand Canyon, but they share many of the same features. So here's what happened. You see, Mount St. Helens exploded and two thirds of a cubic mile of material came sliding down the mountain and it blocked off Spirit Lake from draining into the Toodle River. But Mount St. Helens was not done yet. You see, two years later, it erupted again and the hot ash melted snow in the crater, creating a mud flow. Now this mud flow rushed down the mountain and it carved canyons through all of the material that was deposited two years earlier. Some of those canyons were 140 feet deep and they were carved in just one day. Now, there are even elevated plateaus on either side of the canyon, just like the rims of the Grand Canyon. There are side canyons. There are now small creeks that run through the canyons. Now, if you were to visit the Grand Canyon, you'd see signs saying how it formed slowly as the Colorado River wore the rock away over the past five or six million years. And yet the Little Grand Canyon, with many of the same features, formed rapidly right before our eyes. The eruption of Mount St. Helens is just a minor catastrophe in comparison to the global flood of Noah's day recorded in the book of Genesis. This massive geological event and what took place in the aftermath shaped the world as we know it. And Mount St. Helens is just a reminder of what a catastrophe can really do. I'm David Reeves. Truly, the heavens declare the glory of God. Like what you're seeing? Want more? Be sure to hit the subscribe button to be notified as soon as we put up new videos and content. We see right behind me here, the uh, base of this cliff, the lower half of the cliff, is composed of the airfall deposits, the airfall tephra from May 18, 1980. During the afternoon of May 18, 1980, the volcano was quieting down and airfall debris, large blocks of pumice and fine ash fell on this surface. Then up above it, we see a 25 foot thick layer of layered volcanic ash. That's the pyroclastic flow deposit from June 12, 1980. And then on top of that, we see the mud flow from March 19, 1982. Each layer here on the, this cliff has a date. 
and uh, we can establish the sequence of the formation. One of the most interesting things about that June 12, 1980 pumice flow deposit is it formed essentially in three hours. We have the radar imagery that uh, shows between 9 p.m. and midnight on June 12, 1980, that a big plume of volcanic ash was forming over the crater of the volcano, and these slurry flows came down and deposited the, the pyroclastic flow deposit of June 12, 1980. The most amazing thing about that is its layering. Then above it is the mud flow deposit, March 19, 1982. Every layer has a date, and we can understand the process of the deposition of these layers by looking in detail at these strata. Tell us about Mount St. Helens and what you want us to learn. Well, uh, I, just to call attention to this uh, nine-hour eruption on May 18, 1980, it released uh, 440 million tons of TNT blast energy, wow. 33,000 Hiroshima-sized atomic bombs. 33,000 Hiroshima-sized atomic bombs. And it, it was a colossal explosion. And uh, atomic bomb a second, essentially. So that's the, uh, that's the power output of this volcano. And uh, the scripture, Psalm 46, verse 8, Come, behold the works of the Lord, what desolations he has made in the earth. And I take that literally, right? Yes, sir. Uh, so I go out there to see those desolations. And, of course, we remember what the mountain looked like before. It was a very beautiful mountain. Pristine, it, beautiful. Yeah, uh, forest, lake, everything. And then uh, it lost 1,300 feet of summit elevation on the morning of May 18. Wow. This gigantic landslide, half a cubic mile of summit slid away into the lake and into the river basin next to it. And then behind it, the big steam explosion. And it was just extraordinary. This is the before image, before the eruption. And uh, you can see... Uh, this area. I've got the next photograph from exactly the same position after the eruption, but I'll call your attention to this. You want to look at that, you want to look at that right here, and uh, you might want to look at this ridge right here. Okay, now here it is after. Watch those points carefully. <laughs> They're gone. Yeah, look at look, the top of the mountain completely changed. Wow and uh, it lost 1,300 feet of summit elevation. It's hard to believe it's the same mountain, yeah. okay? Uh, it, it was incredible geologic change. It was Disneyland for a catastrophic geologist like me to go see what the geologic change was there at the mountain. Here's a simulation of the first 50 seconds of the eruption. As the earthquake shook the mountain, 5.1 magnitude earthquake, the whole north slope began to slide in a gigantic debris avalanche. This debris avalanche moving at freeway speed off the mountain, uh, dispersed rock fragments, released the pressure inside the volcano, super hot liquid water in the magma in the chamber flashed the steam. And a supersonic steam jet propelled itself over the debris avalanche deposit. So down there next to the lake, the, the steam blast actually got there first and knocked down and toasted the forest. That's the simulation of what we think happened during the first 50 seconds of the eruption. The southwest corner of Spirit Lake, right in here, is the site of up to 600 feet of deposits. Up to 600 feet of deposits have formed there since 1980. There's a new landslide debris dam for the lake. The lake is in a different, occupying a different position in space, higher than uh, it was sky before the eruption. It's in that's now sky, and the, this whole landscape, uh, something like 62 square kilometer area of, of debris avalanche deposit, has sat there over the last 30 years. We've been able to study what's been going on there. It's Earth's newest landscape, and uh, uh, rapid deposition occurred there. Here you see one of these uh, pyroclastic flows, a glowing avalanche of uh, particles, a dense avalanche falling off of the, ma the mountain. These pyroclastic flows are amazing, 
and uh, they uh, call our attention to the swift process. When the pyroclastic flows stop, they freeze rapidly and they form these very interesting deposits. In cross-section, you can see what a pyroclastic flow deposit looks like. Right here is 25 feet in thickness, a pyroclastic flow. That pyroclastic flow is right there, 25 feet in thickness. That formed on June 12, 1980 by a, a three-hour eruption where glowing avalanche of particles came off the summit. And uh, it deposited a layered or laminated deposit. It was uh, very interesting. Here you see the nine-hour eruption on May 18. You see the June 12 deposit, and then you see the March 19, 1982 mud flow deposit. Each layer at Mount St. Helens has a date. And uh, that, uh, that's amazing. And so as I started looking at the June 12, 1980, three-hour eruption deposit from uh, late in the evening on, May, uh, on June 12, I started uh, seeing that lamination. Here's the top of it. See the layered appearance? I had thought that the catastrophe would homogenize the course and the fine. And this avalanche of particles actually separated it, the coarse and the fine into layers. And uh, so that was, uh, that was shocking to me because I, I thought that something moving so fast like that would homogenize the layers and mix them all together, not separate them out. And the closer you get to the June 12th deposit, the more layered it becomes. There's, there's just a, a foot or so of the upper part. And even lamination right in here formed believe it or not, in a hurricane. Okay, that, that is uh, unbelievable. So the particle separation rapidly challenges our, our, my way of thinking about stratification elsewhere. You know, in the Grand Canyon, the Tapeat sandstone is 350 feet thick. And uh, that has, uh, it's a sandstone, and it has layering like you see at the pyroclastic flows at Mount St. Helens. And so I started thinking about the sedimentary evidence of rapid accumulation of sandstones in the Grand Canyon. We've been accustomed to thinking in terms of maybe 50 million years to deposit uh, hundreds of feet of sandstone. Yet at Mount St. Helens, we've seen the actual process that can form the, the layerings and the stratification rapidly. In one day? Essentially in a day. Uh, three hours there, we saw 25 feet 25 of strata feet three that formed. Yeah. Uh, so the, these processes go on and we need to understand them and their application to other strata layers, like in Grand Canyon. So I find myself believing that a global catastrophic flood can form sedimentary layers, like in Grand Canyon, on the basis of seeing the, 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 the laboratory uh, experiment that God gave us at Mount St. Helens. Okay, now, there's a large amount of erosion that occurred to the, especially to the debris avalanche deposit after the eruption in 1980. And these erosion features formed rapidly. Like there were jetting steam from buried ice and water at a depth underneath the hot volcanic ash. Within days, steam was jetting to the surface. There's the lake, Mount St. Helens Spirit Lake, covered with logs. And then it came back, and look at this. The steaming had stopped a month later and uh, we see around the big steam explosion pit this rill and gully topography. The rill and gully topography is amazing because uh, that formed within five days by gravity collapsing the lip of the pit as this steam eruption was occurring, yet it reminds me of the badlands of South Dakota or some of the deserts of the southwest United States. And if this could form quickly, that did too. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I, I find myself saying, what is there that, uh, that can't form rapidly? Like, for example, here's an ancient lava flow from probably about 500 years ago that was gouged out after the summer of 1980 by a mud flow that came through here. This is on the north flank of Mount St. Helens. Solid rock was gouged out by a mud flow. And today we see the small stream and the waterfall going through the canyon. So uh, can't rapid canyon formation related to um, catastrophic process like mud flows. This is a deep canyon over 100 feet deep, eroded through solid rock, ancient lava flow, ancient volcanic landslide deposit, ancient volcanic ash layer. All that was gouged out after the summer of 1980. 
So erosion is uh, prominent right in front of us, and hard rock erosion uh, making uh, extremely uh, large cliffs and deep canyons. Okay, March 19, 1982, there was, behind the lava dome at Mount St. Helens, back in there, a lot of snow, and that snow melted when uh, the summit eruption occurred. It wasn't a big eruption, but it melted the snow rather rapidly and created what? A big mud flow came down. And a lot of water from the 15 feet or so of melted snow in there all of a sudden came down and it mixed with volcanic ash and formed the mud flows. Most of the mud flow went down the north fork of the Toodle River this way. Also, some of the mud went uh, into Spirit Lake. And that mud flow of March 19, 1982, was big enough to overtop the debris avalanche deposit and cut a canyon through it. And so I've been uh, very interested in studying the area right in here, this area where the uh, big breach occurred, where mud uh, spilled into a pit, overtopped a, a dam, and then drained through a spillway, back cut a, a canyon, what I call Little Grand Canyon. Here you can see the area where the mud flow came. The mud flow came down out of the crater, right through this area right here, ponded right in this area, then it overtopped, came down this uh, spillway, and went down to the, uh, the ocean. This giant mud flow had enough power to overtop that barrier, and as it overtopped the barrier, it cut back through and made, right in that little area there, a little Grand Canyon. So. Uh, huh saw this uh, canyon as I ventured in that area, saw this canyon, and uh, it was amazing. Okay, uh, I can see uh, many of the same features as the real Grand Canyon. The uh, cup-shaped side canyons right here, uh, the gully-headed side canyons that extend up into it. And then notice we have a flat plain north and south, okay, like the real Grand Canyon, and then the breach has a kind of a turning path as it goes through. And uh, so the snaky path reminds me of Grand Canyon uh, oh, sure. terrain. Sure. And so in 1983, in August, I overlooked this. I thought, oh, this is a little Grand Canyon sitting here. I started calling it Little Grand Canyon. Now it's in the peer-reviewed geologic literature, Little Grand Canyon. And uh, so uh, the Grand Canyon is a, um, uh, something to think about as you, you stand here and ponder that terrain. Look at the, uh, the freestanding cliffs and the, and the small stream. The right canyon over here, I'll show you in the next image. Here it is, 140-foot cliff, small stream flowing through that canyon. Do you think that small stream eroded that big, wide canyon <laughs> one sand grain at a time? I don't think so. Okay. Uh, it might appear that way, but we have the eyewitness reports. And uh, this, this was formed by by catastrophic drainage over a period of months as drainage occurred through there and uh, it created this canyon. There is a man right there for scale on top of that cliff, okay, and there's a small stream, okay, and, and you think about that is, that, uh, uh, is that millions of years of erosion or a rapid uh, event? And of course, uh, we all uh, need to appreciate what rapid erosion can do at Mount St. Helens. And it reminds me of the Grand Canyon. The evidence of a lake was off to the east of Grand Canyon. That lake may have overtopped the dam in northern, north central Arizona here, the Kaibab Upwarp. And as the, the lake drained through, it could breach a spillway, just like at Mount St. Helens. Mount St. Helens is a breach dam formed by mud. Grand Canyon could be a breach dam formed by catastrophic drainage of a huge lake. It, it just seems to me that if you look at catastrophe as the reason for one, which we know because, I mean, it's verifiable, then you have to think cas catastrophe when you look at the Grand Canyon. You Absolutely do. have to. Yeah. And almost all geologists now are of the opinion that the Colorado River did not cut Grand Canyon. And we're asking what did really make Grand Canyon now? And we're going to some way out thinking, like thinking about Mount St. Helens, catastrophic drainage of mud breaking the dam. Well, sure. I've been involved with, with uh, looking at the logs and log deposits of Spirit Lake. And uh, I was out at Spirit Lake, uh, sitting down there next to the lake eating my lunch, and I saw these three sticks that floated in. Notice the top of the sticks is, stick, is floating out of the water. And these, these guys are sitting there, standing upright. 
And it reminded me of the logs. Could the logs also float upright in the, uh, the lake? And a uh, million logs were floating in the lake. Could they also go into upright position? They could sink to the bottom and become upright uh, standing logs, I thought to myself. Then they could get buried with the root ends at different levels. I had a hypothesis by looking at those floating sticks that, that gave me an idea that I needed to check out about the bottom of Spirit Lake. Could the logs float in vertical position, sink to the bottom, and get buried in standing position at the bottom of the lake? If they could, that would be a radical rethought thinking of the ordinary way of how wood gets petrified in the earth. Because how do we think of upright standing logs in strata layers? We think, oh, there was a soil and a forest that grew there and was later buried. And so uh, this idea was a very outrageous idea, uh, contrary to the idea how, about how forests might be buried. These are re-embedded uh, or replanted forests, okay, in the bottom of the lake. Take a look at the, the log mat on Spirit Lake. Millions of logs were floating on Spirit Lake the day after the eruption, and then these, these vertical logs start appearing, and inclined logs start getting deposited. And if you look at the log mat itself, there's evidence of upright floaters in the log mat and off to the edge. These upright logs can float with the root ends mostly weighting them down and get buried. So I was able to get out into Spirit Lake with a boat, and with a sonar. And here's a sonar recorder. The sonar recorder is a device that reads the profile of the lake. There's the automobile batteries that, that uh, power the sonar recorder. We made a profile and did a survey of the bottom of the lake. Uh, you see this uh, paper record that's given off by the sonar recorder. And we're looking out diagonally over the bottom of the lake. And we can see uh, several feet of water, probably 50 feet of water or so, below the towfish, and we're looking at the bottom of the lake, and then we're looking out diagonally 50 yards or so over the bottom, uh, and there's the, there's the first reflection from the bottom. But notice, I see a sonar reflector right there, inclined, and there's an inclined sonar shadow. There's a sonar reflector and a big sonar shadow behind it. And then I notice, look at this, immense sonar reflector right there, and then a sonar shadow behind it. Even seems to have outflaring root mass, looks like a log just buried there and replanted. So on the basis of the sonar records, I had to go diving in Spirit Lake. And I'm a, I'm a certified research diver, and uh, so I go diving in the lake. And uh, that, was, uh, uh, that was difficult diving situations. Here you see the, the steaming lava dome. There I am. There's my diving buddy, and we're getting ready to look at the bottom of that upright deposited log in the lake. Underneath the log mat, you can see the logs floating there. And upright floaters amongst the log mats, uh, standing upright as the floating, prone floating logs are there around us. On the bottom of the lake, we saw the upright embedded logs on the bottom of the lake. That verifies that the logs are falling out and getting buried in the bottom of the lake. The logs fell out with their root ends buried at different strata layer levels in the lake, having the appearance of being multiple forests. There I am, there's my diving buddy. Notice no, no bark on the trees. Yeah. So the bark has been peeled off and it's on the bottom of the lake in thick deposits. And uh, if the bottom of the lake was buried with all that tree bark sitting there, it would make a coal bed very much like the coal that we see in the geologic record. God always gives us evidence, always. You see the power that was one volcano 300 what? What did it say? 300 some atomic bombs? Like Hiroshima? Oh my God, that's power. And just imagine, say there, just say there's 10,000 volcanoes going off. What kind of power is going on? There had to be enough power that it created tectonic plates that split up. Continents. Think of that power. You know, and when those flows are coming down and it's creating those layers, it's fossilizing animals, fish, plants that we see in the fossil record. You know, last week I showed you a fish with a fish in its mouth. That intense pressure and intense heat created that. It created the gold, created the diamonds, the rubies, the jewels, all that stuff, created it. 
the intense pressure. The heavens are telling the glory of God. They're a marvelous display of his craftsmanship. Day and night they keep telling about God without sound or word, silent in the skies. Their message reaches out to all the world. The sun lives in the heavens where God placed it. And it moves out across the skies as radiant as a bridegroom going to his wedding or as joyous as an athlete looking forward to a race. The sun crosses the heavens from end to end and nothing can hide from its heat. Think about that energy on one, one volcano and what it did, the destruction it did. Created a mini Grand Canyon. We know the real Grand Canyon and other canyons all over the world were created the same way. The next time you drive through Arizona, northern Arizona, or even, you know, out Usury. Actually, Usury Pass Mountain is a good example. Everybody familiar with Pass Mountain in Arizona here? If you drive out to McDowell, Ellsworth, there's this big gold strip that goes through it. Big gold strip. That's one of the layers. That's one of the layers. And then sometimes you're driving through Arizona, you can see where the layers are. All of a sudden, they're, they're bent up. Stripped up this way, this way. Think about that. Massive. Well, I wanted to show you that today and show you this today, that God has given evidence that he exists. The evidence for us is to believe on the Son. Jesus paid the price on the cross for all of us. And it goes for you on Facebook. If you're listening, if you don't know Jesus, now's the time. Exchange your life for his life. He died for you, for all your faults, all your mistakes, and all your sins. You see that. You see the cross. You look at yourself, and you see all the faults and mistakes you've ever had. All of them. Past, present, and future. We're on the cross. Well, Pastor John, I haven't even committed some yet. They're on the cross. They're on the cross. Everything you've ever committed is on the cross. Everything you're going to commit is on the cross. And God has judged Jesus on the cross. He took our guilt, he took God's wrath, and we're free when we receive that is our wrath against us. And a penalty for all that is death. So we died to the flesh when we accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, and we're born again of the spirit realm. That's what it means to be born again. You're born again of the spirit realm. That's accepting Jesus. Amen. Thank you for listening, for everybody. Thank you for today. I hope I didn't bore you. It's really interesting. For me, it is. Remember, Bible Basics or Victories Vision Christian Church, www.victoriesvision.org. Please take time to go to the last page on our website. Look it up. Go to the last page. We have a PayPal section. Give a donation to keep this message of the grace of God, the love of God, going all the time. I thank you very much. Amen. Amen. This is Pastor John Morak with Victory's Vision Christian Church. To understand his teaching, you need to be born again. Jesus replied, Verily I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. That means you won't understand it either. 1 Corinthians 2.14, it says the person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. How to be born again? Romans 10, 9 through 10 says, If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it's with the heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. You can listen to other teachings that we have on victoriesvision.org. That's www dot v i c t o r y s v i s i o n dot org and if you'd like to donate to this ministry you can donate on our website thanks for listening